All right, let's get start on chapter three. Okay, this chapter of we're going to discuss global climate change, and sometimes we call it global warming. We have heard of this a lot. Of course, this is a a very debating topic. Okay, no matter scientifically or or even politically, it's a big topic involving not only science and but politics because a lot of strategies because they're all around the world even policy making are, are, are around this topic again the, the debating I'll bring out my thoughts and you can have your thoughts too but we're gonna learn some facts what we saw by by our scientific studies and why there's warming and why there's a global warming and what causes the warming first and then and what causes global warming as well and then uh, Later on in this chapter, uh, as a separate topic, we're going to study a little bit about chemistry calculations okay, involving how do we quantify the amount of substances in, in chemistry. Okay, so first, as usual, uh, these are some questions we want to ask in this chapter and answer in this chapter. What are the sources of carbon on Earth? And uh, how does carbon move between reservoirs? And how does carbon from one, one, one place to another? And how do we measure that? And uh, what are greenhouse gases to keep us warm? And what are their positive and negative effects about the, of, of these greenhouse gases? And why some house gases are, are greenhouse and why some are not? And what are the consequences of global warming or global climate change? And how do we how do our current climate trends differ from the past? And what our daily actions can, can affect the, the global climate system or environment? So there is something to think about, something we're going to answer throughout the chapter. So first, what is global warming? Okay, global warming is the observed century scale rise in the average temperature of the Earth climate system due to many factors, okay, mostly due to human activities, of course and primarily because of the burning of fossil fuels, okay, natural gas, coal, and uh, petroleum. So because of those, there is an observed temperature rise. I'm gonna show some data later, that's why we see. We bring out some facts and show you the relation, what we think cost the warming. And then, of course, in the end, it, it's a long, long-term study. Eventually, we're gonna figure out are we getting a global warming or, or, or something or not, right? Uh, and of course, the term of global warming is uh, sometimes used interchangeably with the term called climate change. Basically, they're the same thing, but by definition, this book specified that global climate change mainly refers to both human and natural activities. Okay, global warming mostly refer to human activities. I guess that's why they put in different terms. But most times, these two terms are used interchangeably. Okay, next is the data. First, bring you why, why people think there's a warming, there's a change. This is the average global surface temperature related relative to, what, to 1951. Uh, to 1981. So compared to that, this is the temperature. You can see that zero means the temperature is similar. If lower than that, means lower compared to the to those between those 30 years. So this is the range from 80 1980s, uh, 1880s to to 2020. You can see that compared to the 1951 to 1980, like a baseline. Our temperature rise to what average around one degree Celsius, okay, one degree Celsius. This is, you see that especially after 1960 and 50, the temperature is rising slowly in a in a level. Even by now, we can see that the peak temperature is around. Uh, I think these two peak temperatures either 1916 with 2016 and 2020 time. You see those two years is the warmest on record of the global average surface temperature. Okay, so that's first the data showing why we have a global warming. This is true, this is data because we measure the temperature of the global uh, surface and we did an average and compared to what we had in the past, right? That's why we bring out the term global warming. 
Okay, but it doesn't mean, okay, first, there's something, that's why I was something I wanted you to think about is, here we have the trend of what? Rising, right? But do you think, do you think or do we know this temperature rising is gonna go keep going up or for some terms it's gonna go back down again? We don't know, right? That's why it's a, it's a very long-term study. It's, it's also, that's why it's still a debating topic uh, even across the world, okay? But here we wanna learn some science behind it. First is what is warming, okay, what is warming? Why we have a, have a warmed or relatively warm environment to make this planet a livable or what habitat, right? Here is the background. We have seen this picture in chapter two. That's the radiation from the sun, right? We know if you look at the pie chart, 39% of the radiation is visible. That's bring us light and make us, our eyes can see stuff. And we have 8% of UV radiations, which are what? damaging to our, our skin and damage to the biological system, but owing to the ozone layer, okay, those UV radiations mostly were absorbed. But majority of the radiation from the sun, 53%, okay, especially you can see that after the, the red light, so around 700 nanometers, we know visible is 400 to 700 nanometers, after 700 nanometers all the way to 4,000 nanometers, this wavelengths of radiations are all what? I am called infrared, okay, called infrared. And remember, infrared has what? Longer wavelengths than visible, meaning what? It's lower energy than, than visible light, and we're gonna talk about and use that info as well. So even though, okay, even though it's 53%, I mean, still majority of the radiation, but this part of the radiation are the part of sun, the radiation from the sun, who makes us warm. Otherwise, our planet will be a freezing planet, a freezing rock. Okay, here, this picture shows you the energy balance from the sun, okay, from the sun. You can see that if we count 100% radiation from the sun, that's 100%. Around 46% is absorbed by the rock, by the, by the earth, by the big rock. Out of the 46%, okay, out of 6%, after absorbed, 37%, okay, 37% emitted by the earth will be in the form of infrared. And that 37% is actually trapped by the atmosphere. Okay, imagine that during the day, okay, during the day we know we get what? We get sunlight, we get radiation. That sunlight includes what? Visible light and what? IR. We're warm. No matter what, we're warm. But if you imagine during the night what happens? There's no sunlight. So there's got to be something what? to keep the warmth, keep the energy. Here is what we're talking about. During the day, 46% of the radiation is absorbed. And when there is no other source of radiation, like during the night, you're not facing the sun, the Earth is going to emit that energy in the form of what? Ion. Okay, in, the form, in, in the form of long wavelengths radiation, mostly ion. And of course, some are emitted into the space, but 37% out of 46%, that's majority of it, uh, right? If you do the math, 37 over, over, over 62, around 80, or 80% 80 or something, are not gone. They're trapped by the atmosphere. That means what? During the night, we're still what? Warm. We're not, we're livable, even though it may be colder during the day, but we're warm. And this effect of the atmosphere gases trapping the IR radiation from the Earth, basically, ultimately from the sun, is called greenhouse effect. And because of that, okay, because of that, 
we have an average temperature on Earth of 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, without that, we can say that without this natural balance, the average temperature of the Earth will be minus 18 degrees Celsius, which is no way we can survive. Okay, no way we can survive without heating loops. So, first is what is greenhouse effect? Why there is a greenhouse effect? And what gases in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, the gases are trapping the heat for us? They're trapping the heat for us. Here. The gases absorbing and trapping the infrared radiations are called greenhouse gases. The major greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, remember we said in chapter one, the main component of the air is what? Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, argon, and water vapor, right? These gases. And you can see that the gases that traps heat are not the main component, but what? But water and carbon dioxide. The most two important greenhouse gases are water and carbon dioxide. You can see the major greenhouse gas water absorbs 36 to 70 percent depends on whether your weather is dry or not right if it's dry you have less air water vapor if it's humid you have more water vapor and besides that carbon dioxide causes 9 to 26 percent and besides that there are other other greenhouse gases such as methane and ozone which are even pollutant okay but the main greenhouse gases are the minor components water vapor and what carbon dioxide and of course, we're going to explain why these two gases absorbs and traps by our. Okay, again, the presence of these gases is essential for keeping us warm, keeping our planet habitable, a, pl a habitable planet. Now, you man, imagine, because the heat is trapped by the greenhouse gases. So, one first thought of we trying to explain why the temperature goes up is what to think do we have what more greenhouse gases right remember we show the first chart the average temperature of the planet earth is what increasing during the past 20 30 years so the temperature the warmth is by what by trapping heat by these gases so if the temperature rises one first thought is what are we getting more greenhouse gases? Okay, water vapor mostly is stable. Okay, it's by weather. So the, the, the first gas to study, if it is getting more, is carbon dioxide. Okay, this picture show you, it shows you a chart of carbon dioxide concentration from 1957 to 2020, measured in, in Hawaii, I think they stationed in by, by this uh, uh, called NOAA, NORR or something, and NOAA, I think. You have a reading assignment, actually, in this chapter uh, by this institute. They measured the carbon dioxide concentration from 1958 to 2020, and you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration is what? Significantly increasing from 60s to, to 2020 year. And okay, this year, I, I updated the slide in 2020, this year's peak value, 2020, is in March of 2022, sorry. This year's 2022, uh, last year after the slides. The peak value was 418.81. That's the highest so far regarding carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, we do find something. The carbon dioxide is what? Increasing. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gases, so it may what? Contribute to the trap more heat. Okay, and also, by the way, okay, this one I'll leave it to read. If you look at the, the line here, the black one is the average. So it's what? Increasing. The red one is the real concentration. You can see that within a year, the carbon dioxide concentration, even though it's generally it's increasing, but within a year, what happens? It's kind of going up and down, right? Giving you this chart. This is a, a, a regional part. I want to show you what it means. This is the average, but the red one are the ones they put it, because every dot means where the, when they pick the same point and measure it. 
the carbon dioxide concentration does fluctuate within a year, like a seasonal fluctuation, right? You can see that during what? During what season is the highest, during what season is lowest, and the next year, the same season will be highest, next year will be the lowest. Okay, I'll leave it to some reading. It's very interesting. It's called a killing curve. Okay, killing what causes a seasonal fluctuation of carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, but again, if you pl plot it and average carbon dioxide, it's what? It is increasing. Okay, but again, uh, it's very fun to, to read about uh, what is a killing curve, why there's a seasonal fluctuate. Okay, now, the previous chart shows us from 1958 or what, in 1960 to 2022. What about if we want to know the carbon dioxide concentration way early than that? Prehistorical, for example. How do we know that? We have a way, actually, by digging the iceberg. Get digging iceberg. When, sorry. When, when water freezes in North and South Pole to form iceberg, to form ice, <coughs> and during that process, <coughs> the air, some air, will be trapped inside the ice as what? As air bubbles. And once it's trapped, it's what? It's fixed. The, compo comp the composition won't exchange with outside, so that's what? Fixed. So it depends on when the iceberg was trapped, you can actually tell the air composition of what? That point of time. Of course, the iceberg is keep, keep getting what? Thicker and thicker. So the deeper you dig, the earlier air you can what? You can get. You can. And by that technique, okay, by that technique, we can actually get the carbon dioxide concentration back to what? You can see that back to 4,000, 400,000 years back. Okay, 400,000 back. And while other ice cores can even go even further, and this is the chart shows you 800,000 years back before present. And it's very fun, you can see that the carbon dioxide concentration is actually what? Fluctuating too. I mean, over the long, what, 800,000 years of, of period. Okay, we do have a higher carbon dioxide concentration and we do have a what? Lower one. We do have a higher one and we do have a lower one. Of course, okay, of course, nowadays, the carbon dioxide concentration in average is at least 100 ppm higher than any time in the last million years. Okay, that's one fact. Again, these are the facts. Okay, a few facts is we know what? We know the temperature is rising. Okay, it's one degree higher than before. We also know carbon dioxide concentration is what? It's rising. And then we, if we look at the data even way million years, a million years, a million years before, we found out the carbon dioxide concentration is actually what? Fluctuating. Okay, it has higher point, has lower point, but again, nowadays, the carbon dioxide concentration is what? Is the highest, way higher than before. Okay, and finally, I want to show you, okay, finally I want to show you, this is a, putting two charts together. The red chart is the temperature chart. The blue one is the carbon dioxide. What do you see? When the carbon dioxide concentration is higher, the temperature is what? Is higher. The carbon, when the carbon dioxide concentration is low, the temperature is what? Extremely low. Take a look, this, this is the temperature. Minus 15, what does it tell you? We have a word for that. It gets hurt, you have heard of word? It's pre, prehistorical time, even when humans are exist, started to exist. When temperature are extremely low, or extremely low, what's that? period of time called ice age. This is why we have an we had ice ages before. It is what? It is when the carbon dioxide concentration is low, temperature is what? It's low. That's why a lot of humans died, animals died because of ice age. This is these the bottom part is of course ice age. Age means what? It's a long time. Okay, long time. 
Now, if you look at here, that's why I myself have doubt in me. I, I, I am not an expert on, on, on global warming. But again, this is why it is a debating topic. Is As you can see here, the temperature nowadays is at what? The higher place, right? And also we see that carbon dioxide is indeed much higher than what? Than before. But now, we're only in 2023. Do we know or is anybody sure the temperature here is going to go again, up again, or we're going to start to fall down and have another ice age? We don't know, right? It's something in the future. So again, there are some studies and there are some correlations and we agree carbon dioxide is what is much higher now. Okay, carbon dioxide is greenhouse gases. Supposedly, it will trap more heat. Those are all facts. But again, global warming is a trend. It's a long, long-term study. So there's a lot of things to, to read, to, to study, and to hear, to listen, and, and to, to observe. Okay, once time goes by, it's a long time. Maybe we, we won't be able to see that, but our later generations may be able to see that. So we will, they will maybe tell whether the temperature is gonna still go up or have another cycle, right? You can see that this is now at what? The peaks tied up temperature. Okay, again, I'm here, like I said, this chapter for me, I'm not an expert of studying global warming, but I wanna show you the facts, and the most important, of course, study the chemistry and science behind it, okay, behind it. So these are some background about global warming and also greenhouse gases and the increase of the greenhouse gases. Okay, this picture shows called global carbon cycle, basically explaining how carbons travel between reservoirs. And also first time, maybe the first time showing you where are carbons, remember carbon dioxide is from, from carbon, right? So where are carbons stored? Okay, where are carbons stored? You can see that carbon can be in deep ocean, can be in fossil fuels, can be in salt, and can be in forest, can be in the ocean, etc. And we're putting come carbon dioxide by some, by some activities. We're also taking out carbon dioxide by some activities. Okay, some natural activity, some human activity. But if you do a simple map, okay, the arrows, for example, the arrows pointing to the atmosphere are mainly the arrows, the activities that what well, emitting carbon dioxide. The arrow going back down means you're taking carbon dioxide back to the reservoir. So if you do a simple math, adding the numbers, putting back and adding the number, putting in, you will find out we are putting more carbons than we remove carbons. Okay, for example, we're doing some deforestation, we're cutting more trees, but we don't do what? We don't build, we don't plant more trees. And also we're burning a lot of fossil fuels than before. So these are some activities that will cost we do what? We put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, there are by tons. This is genies, gilling tons. Okay, and there again, you can do a very simple math and show you the balance of carbon. Okay, how or why or what activities are causing we getting more carbon dioxide? Okay, of course, one of the main contribution of emitting. A lot of carbon dioxide is by burning fossil fuels. Okay, burning fuels for electricity, for transportation, and for heating are the main contributors to what? To carbon dioxide emissions. Okay, every second also, we have rainforest being cut down and burned to what? To, to maybe for our commercial purposes or for, uh, for planning purposes, for agricultural purposes. So a lot of rainforests are cutting down. That means we re we're losing trees that can what? That can use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. It can remove for, uh, carbon dioxide. And these are the sectors, okay, the percentage of different activities, agriculture, power, heating, deforestation, that contribute to increase of carbon dioxide. And this chart shows you the main or big economical entities that are emitting the most amount of carbon dioxide, you can see that the United States is the top, China, Russia, Germany, and the 
nowadays they probably can put all Europe together in, in, in as, as EU, but these are the main economical entities that are emitting more carbon dioxide, getting carbon dioxide. Uh, again, I'm giving you the facts and give you some, some data and then hope you can do some readings, especially this year you can, you can see because of Ukraine and, and, and Russia war, the European countries are cut ties with Russia, so they're not getting natural gas from Russia. And they have a problem of getting enough fuels for what? For heating, for even for surviving the winter. So you can have more, there are a lot of news and a lot of stories on this too. I mean, they're all related to this emitting carbon dioxide. Okay, mostly remember, European countries are the first want to reduce what they want. They're the first generation of a lot of electric cars. Okay, which is a good way, but there one way to think about we'll, we'll talk about over chapter eight too. Even though electric car is perfect for reducing what? Carbon dioxide. But the generation of electricity still need to burn what? Fuel. Right? So it's still a, a debating one. Are are you getting less carbon dioxide emitted or, 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 or no? Okay, there's a debating. You are using electricity to power vehicles. Your vehicle does not emit carbon dioxide, but the electricity your vehicle is powered on is from what? Mostly from burning fuels. Okay, we'll study that in chapter four and chapter eight as well. Okay, and next, okay, very quickly, some consequences of global climate change. Okay, one thing is when the temperature is higher, okay, temperature, the global average temperature is higher, then ice is going to melt. So this is the picture showing you the Arctic uh, ice. Okay, comparison to 30 years average, you can see a lot of ice melted. They said there's a declining at a rate of 9% 9, 9, 9 per decade. Okay, per 10 years, they're gonna decrease by 9%. Of course, when ice melts, okay, when ice melts, the sea level is going to what? Going to rise. Okay, this picture shows you the, the change in the sea level. You can see that the Blue ones means the sea level is increasing. You can see that globally, most areas of the sea level is what? Is increasing, especially areas near big cities. You can see this is China, this, this is North America. These sea levels are increasing the most. What that tells you means if, okay, if the trend is going on like this, then maybe the, the city, the big cities along the, the coast is going to be what? Under the sea. Okay, we may not see it, our next generation may see it, we don't know. Okay, and besides that, okay, besides that, there are other impacts and consequences, like some more extreme weather, more storms, more drought, and change in the chemistry of ocean, we're gonna see that in a few minutes, and loss of biodiversity, and also vulnerability to, to the, some fresh water resources, et cetera. Okay, this next picture. I think this picture won some big price. Is showing uh, showing that two thirds of polar bears will disappear by 2050 because of their loss of their habitat because ice are what melting, right? And also uh, another consequence, like we said, changing the ecosystem of the ocean is with more carbon dioxide emitted, more carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in the ocean, which will cause the pH of the ocean to decrease make the ocean more acidic. We studied that in chapter six as well. And that will cause a lot of shellfish, their shells to, to, to damage, to, to be impacted and even to melt. Okay, because the ocean gets more acidic. The reason is the ocean would take more carbon dioxide. Ocean is a big reservoir if you remember. Let's go back to, to this picture. You can see that ocean is what? It's a big reservoir. Big water is a big reservoir, including surface water and deep water. They, they take a lot of carbon dioxide. If you put more carbon dioxide in there, the more carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in the ocean, which will cause the ocean water to be more acidic. Okay, acidic. So, uh, again, that's all the background showing you this topic. Okay, and of course, in this class, we show something about the society and policy and, 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 and changes. And most importantly, we want to study why the greenhouse gases can trap IR, right? Can trap heat. Okay, what causes them to absorb IR? 
Okay, those are the first important topic. We want to answer that topic. And then, like I said, after that, we're going to have a small section of chapter three to discuss calculation. We hope you use the whole lecture to talk about calculation. So let's take a look. Why carbon dioxide and water, and also other molecules, absorb ion? But the main component of the air, nitrogen and oxygen, they don't, right? Here on the bottom, okay, on the bottom, I show you the models of these gases we mentioned. This is what? Water, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and oxygen. Okay, oxygen. These gases, especially these two, when they absorb IR, what happened is, is the IR cause the molecules, like these two, the bond of these molecules to vibrate. Okay, to vibrate. Remember, these molecules have what? Chemical bonds. When they absorb IR, the IR will cause the bond within the molecules to vibrate. Vibrate meaning include bending and stretching. Okay, we'll see that. I'll, I'll, I even bring a model here. I will show you what is bending, what is stretching. Okay, uh, this this first. Okay, what happened is when they absorb IR, they use the energy of the IR to what? to vibrate. The molecule bond is going to vibrate. And these two molecules, their bond don't vibrate, responding to IR. That's the main reason. Of course, we're going to explain again later more. And whether a molecule can vibrate or not is related to a very important fact of the molecule, that is the shape. Okay, shape. Shape is a, is a more like an everyday word. The better word is called the geometry of the molecule. It is the geometry that determines whether a molecule will have IR absorption or what type of IR absorption or not. Okay, so first, before we even study IR absorption, we need to take a look at the geometry of molecules. Now, before we do that, there's one thing I do want to remind you. You did a great job, I think when drawing loose structure in the quiz, remember you submitted five, they're all perfect. Okay, so I, I don't think you had any problems. If you follow the rules of drawing loose structure, first what? Determine the number of valence electrons, then use a pair of electrons to bound the central one and the surrounding one, then you satisfy the octet from the outside, then from the inside. If, it did, if the inside atom is not happy, you try what? Try multiple double or triple bond. Okay, these are more practice for you in case you need for doing Lewis structures. But the reason we put it here is in order to determine the geometry of a molecule, the shape of molecule, you first need a Lewis structure. If your Lewis structure is wrong, then whatever you decided the geometry is wrong. The bottom line is you need to have a Lewis structures on paper first before you can tell the geometry, which is easier than doing the structure, in fact. Okay, so what is geometry? Okay, what is geometry? We know molecules are not two dimensional. Okay, even though, for example, this is the Lewis structure of CH4, right? C bonded with four H's. We put it on paper, it looks like, oh, they're on the plane. But in fact, the molecule is not two dimensional. The real geometry, the, the, the molecule look like this. This is carbon, this is what? Four hydrogens. Okay, I can build a model. Okay, I can build a model real quick. Okay, the molecule is not two-dimensional. Okay, not two-dimensional. Even though we use Lewis structure on a, on a two-dimensional way, but the molecule itself is not two-dimensional. That is why we have to determine the geometry of a molecule. And, of course, in this chapter, we use geometry to determine whether the molecule and how the molecule absorbs IR. But the geometry itself is a very important info to determine the physical and chemical property of a molecule. Not just IR absorption. 
a lot of physical and chemical property is determined by the geometry. And by looking at the structure here, you cannot tell what the monic look like. You have to know the geometry of the monic. Okay, that's why we have to study the geometry. Okay, now, with, the, oh, by the way, this is my thing. Take a look. Is it the same as CH4? See, you put on the paper, it's nothing like this, right? This is what methane CH4 looked like. This is what monic looked like. Okay, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see this monic again. Okay, by the way, I want to show you here. Now, how do we tell the geometry? Okay, we tell the geometry. Half of the version, okay, the simpler white version. Uh, in this class, we don't tell the geometry of a complex molecules, but the theory is the same, shown here. Okay, in a very simply, simplified way so we can, you can understand easily, is with the Lewis structure, again, okay, that's what we said earlier, you need a what? Correct Lewis structure. You can first locate the valence electrons on a central atom. We know what a central atom, right? We know, when we draw a Lewis structure, we put a central atom, we put a surrounding atom. With the Lewis structure ready, you can tell how many valence electrons are around the central atom. We know where is what. There are eight valence electrons. Okay, but the valence electrons on the central atom are not all together. They're in different groups. Okay, they're separating different groups. And those groups of electrons, because they're electrons, they're negatively charged. So those groups of electrons are going to repulse each other. Negative charge repels negative charge. And because of that, those groups of electrons want to be what? As separated as possible. Does it make sense? And because of that, the molecule's geometry is determined. By what? By the molecule want to maximally separate the what? The valence electrons on the central atom. Okay, on the central atom. For example, on, on this guy. If there's a central atom, you have some valence electrons on the central atom, and the central atoms happen to have two groups of electrons. Remember, if there are no matter how many electrons are there, if they're in two groups, what happens is these two groups of electrons want to be what? As far away because they repulse each other. They don't like each other. So how can two things be apart from each other? The most is to adopt what? A straight line called a linear geometry, right? Only like this they can be further. Like this they are not further. This are not further. Only when they're what? North and south, or east and west, they're what? Further apart. And because they're further apart, this will tell what? The geometry. This will already determine what? The geometry. Does this make sense? Okay, and the same for three groups of four groups, we'll see more. Okay, and this theory, the way we just talked here, is called the VIS, V S E P R, VSEPR theory, called VIS. Shell electron pair repulsion. And those electron pair will what? Minimize repulsion by what? Maximum separation. Okay, maximum separation. So with that, let's take a look a few examples. Then you will know better what this means. Okay, first is our carbon dioxide. Okay, first is our carbon dioxide. I think you still remember the Lewis structure of carbon dioxide, or if you don't, I think you draw a molecule which is very similar to carbon dioxide, which is carbon disulfide. Remember that in your quiz, CS2. Remember the molecule CS2. Now, okay, they're very similar. This is basically the Lewis structure on carbon, oxygen, oxygen on carbon. There are two double bonds. Total what? 80 electrons. Now, if you look at those 80 electrons, okay, if you look at those 80 electrons, those 80 electrons are located in what? Two double bonds. 
One double bond has what? Four electrons. Another double bond has what? Another four. So that means those eight electrons are separated into how many groups? Two, two groups. Even though they're double bond, but those electrons are all together. So that's counted as one group. If those two groups are, if those electrons in one, one, two groups, what happened is what? Those two groups of electrons needs to be what? And that will determine what? The geometry of these two oxygen, which is what? Linear, as far as apart. So the geometry of the whole molecule is what? Is linear. Okay, we use the, 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 some word to describe the geometry. The geometry here is what? Linear. Why we care about central? Because the central electron determines what? The overall geometry. Think about a flower, right? When you, th when you think about what the flower looks like, you look at what? The center of the flower. And the center flower grows the petals that determine the geometry of the flower. The same way, you look at the central. That's why we don't care about the surrounding. We only care about how the electrons are grouped around the central atom. Okay, that's first is linear geometry. Another important term when we talk about the geometry of molecule is the angle of the bonds. Okay, this is one bond, this is what? Another bond. So the angle between these two bonds, because it's linear, the angle will be what? 180 degrees. Total is 360, so the angle will be what? 180 degrees. So that's all. When we de describe the geometry, we describe these two things. First is, what is geometry? Use like a in geometric terms called linear. And what is the bond angle? 180. Make sense? Yes. Okay, let me see quickly. I can view the model for carbon dioxide for you. Okay. And later on, I'm gonna show you our website. You can use that to, to draw molecules and then the, 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 the website will give you a, a model too. Actually, you can view it. This is what carbon dioxide looks like. Mm -hmm. See that? Linear. Yeah, linear. Of course, like a stick. And the bond angle is what? One. 180. Okay, 180. Next, okay, let's take a look at this molecule. SO3. Okay, SO3. Sulfur trioxide. Sulfur trioxide. This is the Lewis structure for sulfur trioxide. Of course, I didn't put the electrons on the oxygen yet. You can put them in. Here, we just, again, because we only care about Central atoms, so I didn't put the electrons here, which is not a complete Lewis structure, of course, but it's a correct Lewis structure without the electrons on the surrounding oxygen. But if you look at the sulfur, the central atom, you will find out the eight electrons around the sulfur are grouped into what? Three, Three groups. Two groups are what? Single bonds. One of the group is a double bond. So with three groups of electrons, again, they want to what? Maximum separation. The maximum separation can be achieved when the molecule adopt a shape like that. We call that planar, trigonal planar geometry. What does trigonal planar mean? Here, trigonal planar geometry. What does trigonal planar mean? Means those three are in what? In a triangle, if you look at that, it's a triangle. And if I, my hand is a central atom, you can see these three groups will be like this. Okay, if you connect all three, it will be like a what? Triangle. Planar means what? Really means all these bonds and the atoms are actually on the same plane. So technically speaking, this molecule is two-dimensional. Right? You can put it on the, on the box, on the, on the table. Because they're on the what? Same plane. That's what we call trigonal, trigonal planar. Okay, trigonal planar. And trigonal planar, of course, the model looked like this. You can see that. The bond angle is 120. Why 120? Because the total is what? 360. So bond angle between here and here and over here, there is what? It's 120. That's trigonal. Good? That's how these three groups can be what? 
can be maximally separated. Now next, very interesting one. This is what? Ozone. Ozone, we know we have an oxygen is what? Central and two oxygen are surrounding. This is the Lewis structure. If you look at the ozone, still how many electrons? Eight. But those eight electrons are grouped into three groups as well. What are those three? Double bond, single bond, single bond and what's that called? You didn't ask me about it, right? Or he asked me about it. The one that's not, not involved in bonding called non-bonding or lone pair electrons. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, not involved in bonding, they're called what? Lone pairs. Okay, lone pairs. So still what? Three groups. And we said in previous slide, if there are three groups around, those three groups of electrons will adopt what geometry? Tragonal planar. Very good. But if you look at this oxygen, only two groups of electrons are connected to what? Oxygen. Is that right? The other group is what? Electron. Electron means what? Nothing in there. Is that right? It's just the electron. It is there, but no atoms is bonded to it. So what happens is these three groups look like this. Called again, trigonal what? Planar. But only two groups are with atom. The other group is what? Electron. So the molecule geometry is like this. You agree? Oxygen and what? Oxygen and oxygen. There's an electron here, of course. There's, there's a group of electrons here. You don't, just don't see it. So the molecule looks like this. We call the geometry... It's easy to understand, right? What is bent? Like this one. Okay, like bent. Why bent? Because it was from trigonal planar. Right? Those three groups, again, are still trigonal planar. But the geometry of the molecule itself is what? Bent. Does it make sense? And the bond angle you can assume it's still 120. We don't discuss why it is 117 in this class. Okay, why 120? Because it's what? Trigonal planar, right? We know trigonal planar is what? 120. Here you can assume it's 120. Again, in this class, we don't discuss why it is 120. It's slightly less than 120. Okay, the reason is I can show you here, um, but this electron, this pair, pushes more than the other two pairs because it's lone pair. So kind of like a squeeze is a little more. So you can see that as well, a little bit less than 120. Again, you don't have to explain. Okay, this is in, in the scope of general chemistry because that electron pushes more. Remember, they're what? Repulse each other. So this one repels more than these two together. So kind of squeeze them, making them slightly less than 120, but still what? Close to 120. But again, this geometry is sometimes called derived geometry. Derived from what? Does it make sense? So you need to keep in mind, when you're determining a geometry, you know three groups is trigonal planar. That's no fault. Okay, no mistake. But you need to ask yourself, are those three groups or atoms bonded or not? If there's, if, if there's one group or two groups are lone pairs, you need to what? Take that off. Okay, then you will get a derived geometry. Make sense? This is the Lewis structure of CH4. Okay, we've seen that again. On this carbon, okay, apparently very simple. On this carbon, those eight electrons are in how many groups? Four, four groups. When there are four groups, those four groups can be separated the best when they are arranged like this. We call this geometry tetrahedral. Yeah, I don't know if you have studied uh, like a, the math or not. Tetrahedral is a, is a shape like this. Kind of like a pyramid, but all the faces of the, the tetrahedral 
are identical. Okay, if you connect those, every single face are the same. No matter how you put place the molecule, they will look identical. Okay, no matter you play like this or that, the molecule is the same. Okay, this geometry is called tetrahedral. In this geometry, all four groups are maximally separated. And the bond angle, okay, bond angle between any CH bond and here, here, is a magical number. That's derived from, again, from math, 109.5 degrees. Okay, 109.5 degrees. That's determined by the geometry. And the molecule, again, look like this. That's what? Four groups. Okay? Next. This is the Lewis structure of NH3. Again, here I'm not doing Lewis structure anymore. You, you may have to draw Lewis structure itself. Again, you see that? When we determine the geometry, we always look at what? Lewis structure, right? This is the Lewis structure of NH3. Okay, on the nitrogen, there are eight electrons. And those eight electrons are arranged in how many groups? Four groups. Right? Four groups. So those four groups will adopt the geometry of what? Tetrahedral. Right? But now we know one of the group is not bonded with what? With the atom. Right? It's the empty electron. So if you take this off, the molecule actually looks like this. Okay, molecule look like this. NH3. We call this geometry trigonal pyramidal. Okay, pyramidal means what? It's like a pyramid. Trigonal means what? The base of the pyramid is a what? It's a triangle. You see that? That's why we call this what? Trigonal pyramid. Right? This 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 carbon, not carbon, nitrogen is slightly raised above. The, the, the base of, of these three hydrogens. But the trigonal pyramidal is from what geometry? From tetrahedral. The reason it's trigonal pyramid because one of the group is what? It's lone pair. It's no, no atoms bonded to it. Okay, so you have to, again, ask yourself, how many groups? Four groups. But how many groups are bonded? Three groups are bonded. So the geometry is what? Trigonal pyramidal derived from what? From tetrahedral. And the bond angle again is 109.5. You can forget about the 107. Okay, again, 109.5 is from what? From tetrahedral. Okay, again, why is less than 109? Like we, I, I mentioned to you, the lone pair is stronger repulsion, so kind of what? What? Pushing them harder. So the bond angle is slightly squeezed a little more than. And this is a link. I think you can even click the link and play with it. Build a monocle, you can draw a monocle in there, and the, 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 the software will, will generate a model. You can turn the model and, and review it. Okay, again, this is what a monocle looks like. You see, three hydrogen and nitrogen. Nitrogen is slightly above the, the face of, of, the, of the hydrogen base. Okay? Last one, I promise. Is what? Water, right? Water is. H2O. O is the central. On the O, there are four groups. Two single bond and two what? Lone pairs. And we know four groups, the geometry of the four will be what? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. But how many lone pairs? Two. Two lone pairs. So if you take two off, only two bonded, the geometry is called? Bent again. Right? But this bent is different from the bent we studied before. This bent was derived from what? Tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. The other bent here is derived from what? Trigonal pair. How can we tell the difference? Bond angle. This bent, the bond angle is what? 120. The bent for water, the bond angle should be what? 109.5. Again, why is slightly net? Because there are two lone pairs pushing a little harder. So that's why the bond angle is even smaller than 109. But again, just use 109.5. This is what water looks like. You see that? This is what modern lo water looks like. Right? All right? So this is how we determine the geometry. This is a summary of four groups. Okay, I want to put a summary here so we can, again, study them all together. Uh, 
if you are four electron groups, the electron group geometry, again, this is geometry is called what? Electron group geometry is determined by what? By those four. They're all what? Tetrahedral. But depends on how many lone pairs, your molecule geometry will be what? Different. If you have zero lone pairs like this, then the molecule geometry is the same as what? Electron geometry. If you have one lone pair, the molecule will not be geometry. Tetrahedral will be what? Trigonopyramidal. If you have two lone pairs, your geometry will be what? Bent. Sometimes some other books called angular is the same as bent. Make sense? Again, there's two terms. One is called what? Electron group geometry. That means determined by how many groups. The other one is the geometry of the real what? Molecule. In that case, you have to consider what? Right? So, uh, here's the overall summary of what we studied about using that VSEPR theory to determine the geometry of, of a molecule. Okay, first step, you have to what? Draw a correct Lewis structure. You have to do that, otherwise there's no way you can tell the geometry. Number two is determine what? How many groups are on the central atom, right? When you determine the groups, now you know that. Do we discri disti discriminate bonding or non-bonding? For groups, when we count how many groups, do we oh, discriminate? No, 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 no. We don't care. Bonding is one group. Non-bonding is what? One group. Do we distinguish single, double, or triple bond? No. Double is one group. Single is one group. Triple is also what? One group. As long as there's a bond or a lone pair, they only count as what? One group. So we do not distinguish bonding or non-bonding. We do not distinguish what? Single, double, or what? Triple. And then, determine now how many groups, you determine the what? Electron group geometry. Two groups is linear, three groups is trigonal planar, four groups is centrifugal. But again, this is called what? Electron group geometry. The real geometry of the molecule, you have to consider what? Lone pair. Okay, you have to ask it, does it have lone pair? If it has lone pair, the geometry of the molecule will be different from what? From the electron group geometry. Here is another chart for some molecules we summarized. Okay, so even some new molecules to, to, to again to, to kind of study. Easy, right? Again, the most difficult part actually is not the geometry, but Lewis structure. You have to get a Lewis structure correct before you can do the geometry. Right? Here are some uh, practice. Okay, this one asks you to tell the geometry of those three molecules. I get the geometry here already. Uh, I get the Lewis structure already, so all my math here is. Can you tell me the geometry of the molecule? Okay. Again, when, when, when you are doing quizzes and exams, you may not be lucky with the Lewis structure in hand. You may have to draw the Lewis structure first. Right? So tell me, with the Lewis structure in hand, can you describe the geometry of each molecule? The first one. Oh, it's there. I even give you an answer. Sorry. This one is tetrahedral, right? Because of what? Four groups. This one is tetrahedral because of what? Four groups. This one is bent because four groups with what? Two lone pairs. Two lone pairs. Okay, four groups. Sorry, I didn't even see that. <laughs> All right, so here, let me get one practice for you. Okay, since we have time, okay, one practice for you. Okay, this one, again, I put it ready for you can determine, All right? One practice for you. I'll put it here. I think you've drawn the structure already. HCN. C is the central atom. HCN, sorry, here. C is the central atom. Can you draw the Lewis structure and determine the geometry of the molecule? You can, you can come on board. Okay, HCN. Okay, try to draw the Lewis structure first and then determine the geometry.
Oh yeah, I can tell you which one. Which one? Okay. Uh, uh, carbon has how many? Carbon has four. Uh, and then nitrogen has five. Okay. Uh, and then hydrogen has one, so ten. Yes, total is ten. Perfect. Two How many groups? groups? Two groups. Two um, groups. So it's a. I already forgot the name of two groups. Um, okay, turn. That's okay. Two group is what? Linear. Linear. So on the carbon, because of two groups, so the geometry of the molecule is what? It's linear. That's why you can even draw the linear. Mm -hmm. Right? Perfect. Right. That's perfect. Okay, I don't see any problems with, with you determining the geometry of molecules. As long as you have loose structure ready, all you need to remember is the terms, mm -hmm. okay, with, with the math terms that are describing the geometry or something. And uh, don't worry, you have, even have a lab. Okay, I have a lab asking you to determine the geometry of a molecule. I think there are 20 structures asking you to do. You have to tell me what's the Lewis structure. You have to build the model. You have a kit in your lab kit view the model and take a picture of the model, you have a lot to practice. By the end of the lab, I, I don't think you have a problem with, with naming the geometry of any model. So it should be fine. Okay, even at first, you don't know the term is this guy. Perfect. All right. Let's keep moving on. We can get us started with something here. And we can um, hopefully finish this chapter in two lectures. Okay, let's move on. Now, once we know the geometry of a molecule, we can explain. Okay, we can try to explain how a molecule absorbs ion. Okay, but here I give you an overall picture of how different radiations affect molecules or how molecules react to different types of radiation. Mainly we talk about the radiation as well. Is the radiations around the energy of the visible light. Okay, for example, we studied in chapter two, UV light, because the energy is higher, it can what? Dislodge electrons or even break what? Break bonds. Okay, that's why they can damage our biological molecules. And in this chapter, okay, later on we're gonna study right away, is infrared cause the bond of the molecules to what? There's a word called at the beginning and how infrared cause the bond of molecules to vibrate right vibrate what is vibrate like bending trembling they're not breaking but they're just what like a vibrate moving okay that's causing the bond to do migration now one more is microwave okay microwave the energy is even lower than infrared it cannot even cause bond to vibrate. It can only cause small molecules like water, very small molecules to uh, to spin. Okay, to spin. And because of the spinning, again, we mentioned that, we may have mentioned that before, the spinning cause frictions. That will, is the main technique we use nowadays in our microwave way oven. To what? To heat food. Because Water in our food will be spinning fast by what? By microwave. And the spinning of the water might cause a lot of frictions, a lot of heat. That's why your food is what? Has heat. Okay, again, of course, right away we can take a look. How IR cause a bond to vibrate? What is vibrate? Vibrate basically means a bond is stretch or bend. Okay, if you think about it, the bond is what? Like a, like, a, like a spring, or if you imagine that. How do they vibrate? Like a people vibrate, we were like this. If a bond vibrate, we can either do is what? If they're not breaking, so they can either do what? Like this, or like, the, like a fastly, what we call that stretch. 
Or you can do like this, vibrant one. We call that one bend, right? If the, 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 the movement of the bond is along the line, we call that stretch. If the movement of the one is out of the line, we call that one a bend. That's what vibration means. Okay, they're not breaking, they're just what? Moving by what? By IR. Okay, so let's take a look. Okay, let's take a look. We know, okay, we know when a bond vibrates, it has a certain wavelength or frequency. It means it needs a certain energy. Okay, certain energy to cause the bond to vibrate. And we know IR is the wavelength ranging between what? 700 nanometers to 4,000 nanometers. So that long range of wavelengths corresponds to a long range of what? Energy. Not all energy from a certain IR can be absorbed by a molecule. Only when the IR energy is exactly the same as the vibrational energy of the molecule, then that IR can be absorbed. In another word, if an IR photon, the energy can be absorbed by a molecule, then the frequency about that, of that particular IR must match the frequency of the vibration of the bond. So that means when a molecule vibrates, it can only take a certain amount of IR from the whole spectrum. That makes sense. IR is a long spectrum, has a long range of energy. Some IR has higher energy, some IR is, is orange, because IR is what? Again, from 700 nanometers to 4,000 nanometers. But owning a piece of IR, if the energy matches the vibrational energy of the molecule, that piece of energy can be absorbed. Does it make sense? Now, this picture shows you what type of vibration that we have. So we can know what pieces of energy of IR can be absorbed. Remember, energy corresponds to what? To wavelengths, right? Corresponds to frequency and wavelengths. So that means when IR is absorbed, owning a certain wavelength or a few wavelengths of IR can be absorbed. They must correspond to what? To the vibration of the molecule. So this picture shows you the vibration of carbon dioxide. Okay, again, this is what a carbon dioxide looks like. This is the carbon, these are two hydrogens. We assume the bond is a spring. You can see that the arrows points out the directions of vibration. If the vibration, again, is along the axis of the spring, like you can see this is spring, right? If they're like a really along the spring, we call the vibration stretching. Okay, stretching. A and B are both stretching. The difference is, okay, difference is the A stretching, both are stretching like this, one point's left, one point light. We call this stretching symmetrical stretching. B stretching, you can see that one is squeezing the screen, another one is pulling the screen, a string, we call the stretching asymmetrical stretching. That's easy to understand, right? Mm -hmm. C and D, you can see the movement of the bond is not really along the X, but what? Like, like this, right? The C is like this. The, the carbon moves that direction, these two oxygen move towards me. It's like what? Bending towards me, right? This one is like, uh, oops. <laughs> like this okay point towards it and the other one is kind of like a, a still stretching but not straight from you maybe towards an angle okay for now. but both the atoms will be out of the axis of the spring we call that what so carbon dioxide has 
this four, these four types of vibration. Symmetrical stretching, asymmetrical stretching, and what? Bending. Now, I, I know you're confused and by the way said about how what does it mean the vibration energy match the vibration of the molecule. This picture actually shows you a lot better. Okay, this is called the IR spectrum of carbon dioxide. IR spectrum basically means a graph printed by a by instrument. Okay, this instrument pass IR through a sample of carbon dioxide. And we know carbon dioxide absorbs what? IR. So when IR is absorbed, you can see that when the IR is absorbed, the strength of the IR is going to what? Drop. Right? Think about if the if the machine is getting light out, the light is IR, of course. So when the machine is getting a lot of IR out, passing carbon dioxide, because the carbon dioxide stretch and, and, and the bend then that IR is taken away, absorbed by the carbon dioxide sample. That means what? That part of IR is what? It's gone. If that part of IR is gone, means the IR light strength, if we measure the strength of the light, is going to what? It's going to drop. So if you look at this spectrum, this is the IR ranging from 3.3 .3 micrometer to 20 micrometer. This is a long range of IR. But again, this is wavelength. Most of the IR strength is still what? Close to 100% means what? They didn't get absorbed. If they're absorbed again, they're going to what? Drop. Only wavelengths around what? 4 point something and wavelengths around 15 point something are what? Absorbed. This means what? The vibrational energy corresponds to what part of IR? IR wavelengths of 4 point something. IR wavelengths of what? 15 point something. Does it get a better idea? Mm -hmm. So we, IR is a long range. Okay, IR we know is, is from, so again, 700 nanometers to 4,000 nanometers. Those IRs are not all absorbed by different molecules. For carbon dioxide, this molecule only absorbed how much IR? IR around this wavelength and IR around what? This wavelength. Make sense? Okay, and the other IR, you can see the still full stress means what? They're not much absorbed. Now, these two groups absorption are bicarbon dioxide. Okay, one question we want to ask is this piece of absorption corresponds to which type of, of vibration? This piece of absorption corresponds to which type of vibration? We know we have how many types of vibration? Two types. Stretching and what? And bending. Okay, and bending. This will relates to some topic we said before. First is these two IRs that are absorbed, which one do you think corresponds to higher energy IR? This one you can ask, answer. Which IR is higher energy? Bending, Bending or, or, stretching. or stretching, which one is higher energy? Which one is higher energy? Depending. Higher wavelength. Higher wavelengths will be lower or higher energy. Oh, oh, stretching. I was thinking about the so stretching would be higher energy. Higher energy because lower, shorter wavelengths means what? Higher frequency. Higher frequency means what? Higher energy. So that means. Stretching vibration energy will be what? Higher. Bending vibration will be what? Lower energy. Very good. And you can imagine why. Think about it. If you have a spring, I don't know if you play with a spring, which one is easier? Stretching the spring easier or bending easier? For me, you can, I can let you play with it. Bend is a lot easier. You can see that's very nice. I can bend a lot. Stretch, I cannot stretch too much. That means what? It takes more energy to what? To stretch. That's why stretching vibration takes higher energy. So stretching absorbs higher energy IR. Bending, on the other hand, absorbs lower energy IR. Okay, lower energy IR. Last about carbon dioxide is 
out of these four vibrations, one type of vibration, A, we call that, again, symmetrical stretching, does not absorb ion. The reason is symmetrical vibration. Okay, symmetrical vibration. Because it's symmetrical, the dipole moment of the molecule does not change. So the charge distribution of the molecule does not change, will not cause the molecule to vibrate. So out of these four IRs, okay, B, C, and D, they do absorb IR absorption. A does not, because A vibration doesn't cause the overall charge distribution of the molecule to change. So basically, this vibration doesn't absorb IR. Or you can assume the vibration canceled each other, because it's what? Symmetrical. Okay, again, I list it here. Okay, direct absorption IR does not add H to vibration A, because the charge in the changes in the charge distribution during vibration canceled. Okay, that's one very important fact, actually. Later on, we're going to bring out two. Why N2 and O2 does not absorb IR. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me take a look at the time. Okay, I think we can uh, stop here. Next time, we'll take a look at the, the same spectrum of water, kind of like a review of what we studied today. And then we'll move on to, to study the calculation in chemistry. Okay, next time, I think it better you can bring a calculator okay, in class so we can do math on, on board together. Again, most of the calculations will be in chapter three and four. Perfect. Right.